Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. just heard two scriptures from the Bible, one from the book of Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus was born, prophesying, pointing to the coming of Emmanuel, God with us, the one who would be born of a virgin. And then you heard a passage from Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 1, where that was fulfilled, the fulfillment of the prophecy, that God came among us, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. For this Christmas season, we're going to be walking through this rhythm of looking at God's word and discovering that there were prophecies, things spoken hundreds of years before Jesus came, sort of pointing towards the coming of Jesus. So these old, you know, the first two-thirds of the Bible are the Old Testament, and, 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 it's, and it's, these passages are pointing to what's going to happen in the future. And then, then in the New Testament, we see the fulfillment of those prophecies, but it doesn't end there. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and what is true is true. Therefore, we're going to talk about what it means to live in the reality of those prophecies today. So the Old Testament prediction of what's going to happen pointing forward, the New Testament fulfillment of that, but we can't end there. We have to walk into our lives today and say, if these things about Jesus are true, so what? Does it make a difference in our lives? And what's the answer? Yes, it makes all the difference in the world. And I had somebody, one of the women who goes to our Bible study fellowship here, uh, give me a reference to a, a scholar who did work on this topic of prophecy. And he was actually a scholar who was a mathematician. His name is Peter Stoner. And Peter Stoner was the chairman of the Department of Mathematics and Astronomy for 40 years at a college in Pasadena. And then from there, he went to Westmont College and he held the, the, the chair, he was the chairman of the science division of Westmont College. Westmont College is known to be one of the best Christian colleges academically on the planet. So smart guy, this Peter Stoner. And he was looking at this idea of prophecy from a mathematical standpoint. And, and, and the word prophecy in the Greek is really a combination of two words, uh, before and to make clear. A prophecy is something that's spoken before to make clear what's going to happen. So prophetically speaking out and predicting, predictively saying this is what's going to happen. Now let me tell you something about prophecy. It's really easy to prophesy. It's really easy to predict. predict. That's the easy part. The hard part is prophesying or predicting something that actually happens. You following me? I can make a prediction, right? I can make a prophetic prediction. In 2030, the Warriors will have a season where they don't lose a single game. That was really easy to say. I just said it. That was really easy. I said it, right? That's easy. What's hard to fulfill that prophecy? I'd have 10 years to say, oh, I made this prophecy, but if 10 years from now they lose a single game, guess what? I was wrong. And so, and so Peter Stoner started looking at prophecy and he started saying, okay, what are the odds, as a mathematician, and mathematicians think a certain way, thinking, okay, what are the odds if somebody made a prophecy hundreds of years earlier about this coming Messiah, what are the odds that one of them would come true? That somebody would randomly fulfill that prophecy? What if they were to fulfill two of them or five of them? He finally said, okay, what if somebody, what if, what if there were eight prophecies from the Old Testament that were all fulfilled in the same person? What would the odds of that be? Here, he, he, brought a class, he had 600 students. They all worked together on this. Here's what they came up with. And I'm not a math guy, so I don't know exactly what this means. But here's the odds of a random person fulfilling eight prophecies prophecies written by different authors at different times in history, all pointing to something that would happen in the future, all kind of coalescing in one person. The odds would be one in 10 to the 21st power. I have no idea what that means. Uh, sounds really cool though, doesn't it? You know, one in 10 to the 21st power. So, so Peter Stoner, knowing that most people know math like I know math and wouldn't know what that meant, he said, let me, let me put it in a different way. I'll show you the odds. He says, imagine you took a silver dollar 
and you put, a, you put a big mark on it, and you mark that silver dollar. And you laid silver dollars covering every piece of ground on planet Earth, all of Asia, all of Africa, all of, all of Europe, all of, I mean, every inch of the ground is covered by silver dollars, every part of land on the entire planet. And then you kept stacking up these dollar pieces till they were 120 feet deep. Then you blindfolded someone and said, choose one coin, and that coin will be the one that has the mark on it. That's the odds if eight prophecies are fulfilled by one person. Now, here's what will blow your mind. There's over 60 prophecies in the Old Testament of Jesus that were all fulfilled in one person. I don't even know what that number is. It's just super, super, super big. It's, I mean, I can't, you know, it's, you like to like bury the universe in coins, or I don't know how that works. But, but, but I know that, that this, but, but, but here's the thing, you look at, well, then how could, how could, you know, 60, more than 60 prophecies from different people from different centuries all happen in the same person? And here's the answer, because Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the Savior of the world. He is God who came among us. And the prophets were filled by the Holy Spirit and spoke of what would be, and it all happened in one person because God's hand was in all of that to show us the reality of who he is. And, and so, and so over, these, over these weeks coming up to Christmas time through the first of the year, we're going to take the Old Testament look and say, what did the Old Testament prophets predict about Jesus? We're going to say, how was it fulfilled in the New Testament in Jesus? And then we're going to say, and what does it mean for me? What does it mean for you? If Christ is who he said he was, and if these things are true, how can this change and transform our lives? Oh, Lord, we pray this Christmas season that we will just immerse ourselves in your word, in your truth, and we'll hear these prophetic words about Jesus the Messiah, that we will see how, Jesus, you fulfilled them perfectly and beautifully, and we will be reminded that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, and so who you said you were is who you are. And let us engage with you deeply and personally this Christmas season. Let us not miss you, Jesus, in the midst of all of the holiday festivities. Remind us who you are and what you've done. We pray this, Jesus, in your name and for your glory. Amen. Well, as we, the, the first prophecy we're going to look at is found in Isaiah chapter 7. If you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 7. If you have your phone or your iPad, open up your Bible app and go to Isaiah chapter 7. And you'll also maybe want to open to Matthew chapter 1 as well. We'll look at that a little bit later. But in Isaiah chapter 7, what's really interesting is this is kind of a save the date. It's, it's an ancient prophetic save the date. The problem is Isaiah is prophesying 700 years before it's going to happen. But say the dates are kind of helpful. I got one recently from our office saying, hey, here's the date for the Shoreline staff and, and leadership team uh, Christmas party. Save the date. So I went in to save the date. So what I thought I'd do is I, and now there's big video save the dates. People send little videos for save the dates. So I found a couple of fun save the dates. And I want you to watch three save the dates. The third one is for you. Get your calendar ready. I'm going to have you write down a date for you because it's, it's, you're invited to this, this third one. So go ahead and watch the screens. And I'll just tell you about, you got different. So here's a couple. They're going to get married. They sent out this video. It's very romantic, very epic. Woo, spinning, exciting. And uh, save the date. This happened a couple of years ago, but you get this thing on your phone and you mark down, okay, January 29th, 2017. Save the date. Wonderful. I got a little kiddo, and you're going to have a first birthday party celebration for your little kiddo. So you send out a video. This little kiddo actually has wings, which is kind of cool. And, um, and so you get the invitation. Come join us for the celebration. Here's the date. You know? So come, now, here's the third one, all right? So I'm, we made this one up, and this is, a, write this down. It's a baby boy, save the date, December 25th, 2718. So put that in your calendar and mark that down. We're going to have a great time celebrating. You know, th this is what it would have been like if you knew when Jesus was going to come. Because when, when Isaiah prophesied, when Isaiah is looking forward, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he says, this one will be born of a virgin. His name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. He's prophesying 700 years in advance. Did Isaiah know exactly what he was pointing to? Did the people in his day know what he was pointing to? I don't think they fully got it because if someone right now was planning something 700 years from now, it'd be hard to understand, but God knew what he was doing. And God recorded these words in, in scripture so that we could understand that he was pointing to the coming of the Messiah. So here's what we see before we, before you already heard Isaiah once on the video earlier, but I want to read it in just a moment. But an ancient prophecy pointing to the coming Messiah. When was the prophecy given? About 700 years before Jesus was born. Where? In the southern kingdom in Judah. The people of Israel had 12 tribes. And in the ancient, in the ancient Old Testament days, there were 12 tribes. They had a civil war that lasted, lasted a couple hundred years. 
And they broke into two sides, the northern kingdom with ten tribes, the southern kingdom with two tribes. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But this is a prophecy to that southern kingdom where Jerusalem is the capital. Who is it to? King Ahaz, who's the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. And what's happening? They're in the middle of civil war and oppression. So here, I want you to see what's happening in the world at this time. Uh, you see the blue there, and in the family worship venue, you see the blue part of that map of the kingdom of Israel. Okay, the capital of Samaria. These ten tribes are at war with the two tribes down below in the kingdom of Judah, in the gold there. And also, the Arameans here have joined with them in an alliance, and they're coming to devastate Judah, and they've actually surrounded Jerusalem, they're called a siege, where they've surrounded the city of Jerusalem, and they basically would surround the city, block off all their water, and just wait for them to starve to death and surrender. So, so they're surrounded, and King Ahab, Ahaz is the king, and it's hopeless and desperate and a horrible time. If you've ever been in a hopeless, desperate, horrible times, this would be one of those times. And so this prophecy that we read is spoken to Ahaz, the king of this, the king of this southern kingdom, in the midst of oppression while they're surrounded by their enemies in Jerusalem. So if you have your Bibles open to Isaiah chapter 7, uh, I'll read the key passage in a minute. That'll be on the screen, but the rest I'll just read a couple passages leading up to it. So uh, Ahaz uh, encounters Isaiah the prophet, and Isaiah is speaking to Ahaz. And, and God says to him, be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. Don't lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood. Isaiah, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says these two smoldering stubs of firewood are these two nations that are attacking them. He's saying, don't be afraid. Now watch this. You're surrounded by your enemies. Physically, your city is surrounded. Your people are starving to death. You see no hope. Don't be afraid. In a hopeless situation, God will at times say, don't be afraid. Verse 7, we read this. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says. It will not take place. It will not happen. Your city is not going to fall. They're not going to win. And he's told within 65 years, Ephraim, which is, the, which is the northern kingdom, the 10 tribes, will be too shattered to be a people. And then God says, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. God says to Ahaz, and I believe God says to us, you stand firm in your faith even when you feel surrounded and you feel hopeless. Verse 10, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, the king that's surrounded by their, these two armies. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether it's the deepest depths or the highest heights. God says through Isaiah, ask God for a sign to assure you that I'm going to do what I've promised. I'm going to deliver you. And listen, listen to how Ahaz responds. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test. So Isaiah says, ask God to show you something that, to assure you. He says, I won't ask. And that's, this is where the passage comes in. This is where the passage about Jesus being born of a virgin comes in. It's kind of an interesting time, strange time in history, right? Verse 13. Then Isaiah said, hear now, you house of David. That's the people who are living in Jerusalem. It is not enough to try the patience of humans. Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. That name means God with us. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, when he's old and mature enough to discern right and wrong. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid to waste. You're going to be set free. And, and if you're paying attention to all of that, uh, it, it, will, it will strike you that um, that's a strange environment for a prophecy about the coming of Jesus to come out of. But it's not when you understand what's happening historically and when you understand what the world was like in the days of Jesus. Here's what the prophecy is saying. Here, here's what to expect when, 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 this, when this child is born of a virgin. Here's one thing. Expect to see a pregnant virgin. Just ponder that for a minute. Expect to see a pregnant virgin. Anybody see a problem with this equation? That's not normal. And this is way before there were any kinds of in vitro or anything. I mean, there, was the, there was only one way to get pregnant in the ancient world. And this is a, you know, so that's what you can be looking forward to. What to expect? God in diapers. A baby to be born, and he will be Emmanuel, God with us. Here's what you can expect the maker of the heavens and the earth in diapers. The one who spoke all things into existence, needing someone to feed him. God being born. God being delivered into this world. 
God who made all the world feeling cold and that same one who will feel the pain of the nails going through his hands and his feet. This is an extraordinary prophetic word about the coming of Jesus Christ. A pregnant virgin, God in diapers, and then deliverance. That this prophecy is about you will be delivered. At that time, for those people delivered from these two armies that are breathing down their neck, but also another kind of deliverance when Jesus actually comes. And so all of this is going on when this prophetic word is, is put forward. And I want to introduce you to an important theological concept called telescoping. Telescoping is a prophecy with multiple fulfillments over time. As theologians will talk about how when a prophecy is given in the Old Testament, oftentimes they'll give a prophecy, and that prophecy might be partially fulfilled like in the generation of that prophet or shortly thereafter, and then like a deeper fulfillment later, and then an ultimate fulfillment further down the road. This is a prophecy that had what telescoped out. There were things that happened that they were delivered at that time from these armies that were attacking them. Some of it was fulfilled, but the ultimate fulfillment came 700 years later when Jesus Christ came, Emmanuel, God with us. But many prophecies had sort of partial fulfillments over time and then a final fulfillment. And that's what happened when Jesus came as the Messiah. He fully fulfilled that. So the fulfillment of the prophecy when the Messiah came, so Isaiah prophesied 700 years before this is what's going to happen. But when it actually happened 700 years later, here's the setting. It's 700 years after Isaiah's prophecy. And, and so now it's, it's actually, the historically, the date is... Zero. That's the date. Zero. You say, why do you say zero? Because the coming of Jesus Christ divides all time of human history. Do you realize this? Young people growing up in school now, they don't even really teach this because it it's, it's points to Jesus. And they try to avoid that in public schools particularly. But when you look at history, you have B.C. and A.D. Now, everything from zero, everything B.C., you know what B.C. stands for? Before Christ. That's what it stands for, before, all of history, before Christ, there's two parts, before Christ, and A.D., Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. So all of history is zero, when Jesus came, before Christ, and the year of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and some people are changing the after zero to C.E., and they call it current era. You can call it what you want. You know what zero is? When Jesus was born. Right? I mean, all of our history is divided through the coming of Jesus Christ. So when, so when Jesus Christ enters history, history really, in a sense, begins through Jesus Christ. And so now we have Matthew's prophecy. And if you have your Bibles open to Matthew 1 or your, your phone or your app open to Matthew 1, I'll start in verse 18. And now the fulfillment of this prophecy comes. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, before they had sexual intimacy... She was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. She is a, a pregnant virgin, exactly what Isaiah prophesied. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. They were actually engaged and in the ancient world. An engagement was a very serious thing, so he'd have to actually break the engagement. That's what he was considering doing. But before he could do that, watch what happens. Verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus means God is salvation. Verse 22, and here's what all ties together. This, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Isaiah, 700 years earlier. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. What was prophesied 600 years earlier by Isaiah is exactly what was finally fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The, and so, so Matthew says, this is the fulfillment of what Isaiah prophesied. The, the save the date that he gave. We didn't know when it was gonna happen. 700 years later, now it's actually happening. So what happened? You have a pregnant virgin. Exactly what was prophesied. The impossible has happened. You have a pregnant virgin. What had happened? You have God in diapers. You have very God of very God who comes in human form. And so in Jesus Christ, as hard as it is for our minds to comprehend, you have this child who's born who is fully man and fully divine. Jesus was fully human 
so that he could take our sin and take our shame and take our place on the cross and bear our burdens and pay the price. But he was fully divine because our offense and our sin is against an infinite God. So the only payment you can pay to where you offend an infinite God is an infinite payment. I'm not infinite. You're not infinite. We can't pay that, but Jesus was. So he's fully man. He can take our sin and bear our shame and take our pain on himself. He's fully divine. The price is big enough to pay for us. And those two things bound together, Jesus now is born so he can give his life for us and save us. That's what the the prophet is prophesying. He will come and save his people from their sins. It's a pregnant virgin, God in diapers, and then deliverance. The, The first fulfillment of that prophecy came when the armies were driven away and the people, the people of Judah and Jerusalem was set free, but it was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ when our sin is taken away, our bondage is broken, our shame is destroyed, and we are washed clean through Jesus Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection and the price he paid. That's the ultimate final deliverance. That's the gift of Jesus. That's the gift of Christmas. And so we live in that still today. Prophesied 700 years before Christ fulfilled 2,000 years ago, but Jesus is still at work right now in our lives, setting people free by his power, by his grace for all who will believe. So we have to understand the prophecy and understand that the Messiah is here today, and this is critical, this is central, we cannot miss this. Some Christians like to kind of study the Bible and say, oh, that's fascinating. You know, you know centuries before, you know, Isaiah's prophesying, that's fascinating. You know, 700 years later, Jesus comes. And they leave it there in the historical realm. But they don't say, but right now, now watch this. He is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And the one who delivered the people of of Judah from their enemies, the one who brought deliverance to the world 2,000 years ago, he's here ready to deliver you today for the first time from your sins if you've never received him, but every single day when you feel trapped and surrounded, and afraid, and oppressed, and struggling. He says, I come to bring deliverance. How can he do that? Because he's still Emmanuel, God with us. It's not just a history lesson, it's a spiritual reality. It's a spiritual reality for us today. So what this means for us is that we can live our lives with with the God who is with us, with Emmanuel. When I became a follower of Jesus Christ, I was 16 years old. Many of you know my story. I wasn't raised in the church. I wasn't raised in a believing home. I'd never read the Bible. I became a follower of Jesus at 16 years old. Within two hours, God called me to be a pastor. I knew I had to be a pastor. And I was away on this trip with a bunch of youth. On this youth trip, I made a commitment to Jesus. I felt a call to be a pastor. So when I got home, I told my dad, and remember, I grew up in a home with no faith. And I said to my dad, hey, dad, I'm a Christian. And on top of that, I'm going to become a pastor. He said, there's no money in it. That's what he said. And I said, well, I don't know how that works, but um, that, that's what I'm going to do. And then he said, my next thing, he said, you'll get over it. <laughs> See, some kids, when they go to dad and mom and say, I'm going to be a pastor, they get celebrated, right? Some people, when they say yes to Jesus, they go to every neighbor, a friend here who, when he said yes to Jesus, his parents took him to all the couples in his, in his, in his small group that night, Right? And said, our son said yes to Jesus today. They went from home to home at 8.30 at night, telling their friends, our son gave his heart to Jesus. And I get, you'll get over it. But, but I haven't gotten over it. And and, and here's the reality for me. Um, As a young Christian, so so as a young Christian, most, all my friends, all my friends weren't Christians, and we did a lot of stuff we shouldn't have been doing. I was a pretty wild kid. And so I stopped doing the things I shouldn't be doing, and most of my friends kind of said, either, either they became Christians, (coughs) They either became Christians or they didn't want to be around me. Most of them didn't want to be around me. And so it was kind of a lonely time for me. You ever had those times where you just feel alone and you feel like, Lord, I, you know, I, I want people to be around? And I, and I had a real lonely time in my life then. And I remember, saying, I remember praying and saying to God, I said, God, I just, I feel so alone. And this is what God said to me. And just so you know, I've never heard God here with my ears. Some people have, that's fine with me, but I've never heard God here with my ears, but I hear God in my heart. And this is what God said in my heart. He said to me, Kevin, I will be your closest friend for the rest of your life. And it has been true every day of my life. As much as I love my wife and love my kids and love my friends, their closeness doesn't compare to how close Jesus is to me every moment of every day. Because he is Emmanuel. God with us. 
And if you know him, walk closely with him. And if you don't, turn your heart to him because he's ready to embrace you and wrap his arms around you and keep you close to him for the rest of your life. So I want to challenge you to embrace the prophecy and the fulfillment of this prophecy. Isaiah said, there is one who will come who will be born of a virgin. Emmanuel, he'll be God with us. He will set you free. Jesus came. He was born of a virgin. He was Emmanuel. He was God with us. He set us free. But he's here now today. So I want to challenge you as you walk through just a normal day, Will you walk through your day, if you're a follower of Jesus, will you walk through your day knowing he is with you and talking to him throughout the day? I remember when Sherry and I had our first year anniversary after we got married, my parents gave us a night away at this nice hotel in Los Angeles, and they gave us a certificate for a restaurant for $50. And we said, we can't spend $50 in one meal. And we went to this restaurant, we each got a main dish and shared a salad, and we went over $50. We didn't know that there were restaurants like that in the world. Um, we were kind of poor, we were a young couple. So they sent us away to this, this hotel, and that night, uh, we, we had a great time, and the next morning we woke up, and we each kind of read our Bibles, and then we used to, were talking about what God was speaking to us from his word. And I just began talking about how God was teaching me and guiding me, how I really felt like the Lord wanted me to do this and was directing me, and just talked about how God was speaking and directing my life. And Sherry says to me, she says, you know, when you talk about that, you talk about like that you're... You just like talk to Jesus and he just talks to you and like your friends. And, and I said, well, yeah, that's, that's how I live my life with Jesus. And she said, well, I've been a Christian. She became a Christian when she was five. She's been a Christian a lot longer than you. And I don't feel like I connect with Jesus at that level. So I was super sensitive as a, as a young man. And I said to her, she said, I just, I don't connect with God that way. And I said to her, well, that's your fault. <laughs> Which is exactly what I said, huh, honey? Yeah. I said, you know, because I wasn't as, now I'm super sensitive now. You all know that. But, um, but I, said, I said to Sherry, I said, that's your fault. And she's, she's like, well, what do you mean? I said, I said, well, do you ask him questions? Do you talk to him? Do you treat Jesus like he's with you, like he loves you? I, I said, when I became a Christian, the people I knew that were Christians, they talked about Jesus like he was their best friend. I thought, if you have a best friend, you talk to your best friend, don't you? And, and if you have a best friend, wouldn't they talk to you? Wouldn't they? And again, I've never heard God with my ears, but he whispers and nudges and guides and convicts. And I feel, I, I sense the leading of Jesus through the flow of my days. And so I said to Sherry, just start, just start asking God for that and talk to him like he's your closest friend. And, and, and that has, you know, that began a, a whole new time in her spiritual life of, and, and her intimacy with Jesus has grown hugely as she just expects him to respond. So I want to finish by just, just giving you, and if you're a note taker, write these five things down. Also, if you're not a note taker, we're gonna put these on the front page of our website, so don't feel like you have to write these down. But, but here's five things that you can, in the flow of your day, if, 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 if Isaiah prophesied the coming of Emmanuel, God with us, if Jesus came, Emmanuel, God with us, if Jesus said, when I'm gone, don't worry, I'll be with you and I'll be in you because the very spirit of Christ dwells in us, then he is still Emmanuel, God with us. So how do we live each day? Walking in his presence. Here's five simple prayers and suggestions that I want to encourage you to carry through your days. Here's prayer number one. First thing when you wake up. Good morning, Jesus. Just quietly in your heart. Say, good morning, Jesus. My day is yours. What, what, what do you have planned today? How can you use me today? How can I love people today? How can I, how can I receive your goodness? Just to start your day before you get out of bed and say, good morning, Jesus. This is the day that you've made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. I'm going to live for you today. And just start your day acknowledging his presence. How about this prayer? Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. <laughs> Somebody say that with me. Help me, Jesus. Yeah. Just when, when, when I, I can't do this without you. When you bump into those walls in the flow of your day, and you will bump into a wall every day of your life where you hit something that's just too big for you, that, that, that's beyond your, your, your figuring out, and just say, help me, Jesus. I need your help. I need your strength. I cannot do this on my own. Don't keep fighting through what I got to figure out. Say, Jesus, help me. And you will be amazed at how he will show up and help you through so many things. Good morning, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Someone say it with me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I, I, I give you praise for the little things, for the big things. I got, I got a buddy here, Brad, who's here from out of town. And we've got, he's come out here to play a bit of golf. It's been beautiful weather for golf. And... Um, <laughs> And so we were playing, I had about a, about a, I don't know, 22, 23 foot putt, little three, four foot left to right break, put, a, put that ball rolling turns in the hole in a par three for a birdie, and I said, thank you, Jesus. Uh, not out loud, I just said it in my heart, <laughs> but, uh, but I might have said it out loud, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but but, but you know, the, the little things of life, when, when, you see, when, when you see someone you love take a step forward, something good happened to a fr in a friend's life, thank you, Jesus. When you bump up against a wall and God brings you through. 
and shows you his presence of victory. Thank you, Jesus. For a good meal with friends, thank you, Jesus. Just talk to him, talk to him, talk to him through your day because he is Emmanuel, God with us. How about this one? Lead me, Jesus. Lead me, Jesus. I need your wisdom. Lead me, Jesus. I cannot figure this out. I can't navigate this situation. This relational thing is too complex. This work thing is too complex. This financial problem is too complex. But Jesus, if you will lead me, if you give me wisdom, you know, the book of James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you ask of God who gives, it says, gives joyfully to you, but ask without doubting. Ask trusting that God wants to lead you. Lead me, Jesus. Give me wisdom. You will be amazed at how many hurdles you'll get over with the wisdom of God that you wouldn't figure out on your own. And when he gives you wisdom, you say, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> go, back, you'll go, 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 go back to number three. And then number five, hold me, Jesus, so I can live for you tomorrow. When you lay down at the end of your day, just, just lay in bed and say, hold me, Jesus, this night. You know, heal my wounds from the day. Receive my joy from this day but hold me, Jesus. You see, Isaiah, centuries before the coming of Jesus, he said, one will be born of a virgin who is Emmanuel, God with us, and he will deliver the people. And Jesus came. He fulfilled that prophecy. One of more more than 60 prophecies he fulfilled. And, And he came, born of a virgin, Emmanuel, God with us, to deliver us from our sin and our brokenness. But that same Jesus is here today. And he is with you, and he is watching over you. And if you've come to the cross and received him, he will never leave you and never forsake you. So talk to him like your closest friend. And hold to him. And walk with him. Lord Jesus, we pray. You are Emmanuel, God who is with us. We thank you for that reality. We pray we can live in it in a fresh new way, that we will talk with you through our days, that we'll begin our day by just saying, good morning, Lord. Good morning, Jesus. We'll end our days by saying, Lord Jesus, hold me till the new day begins. Jesus, thank you that you are with us from the morning till the the moment we go to sleep, and even when we rest, you wrap your arms around us because you love us. You are Emmanuel. You are God with us, and we give you praise. Let us celebrate you that way, that intimately, this whole Christmas season and all year round. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Amen.